So what ha I, I guess they did, but I didn't really realize that at the time. Um, when I joined, it was right before the 4th of July, and I actually went to basic training the same week as 4th of July, and because it was a holiday, I ended up having to wait about a week before the rest of the recruits showed up for us to actually start basic training. So I was actually in basic training for a few days where I didn't really do any basic training. Everybody's got that though, but usually you're doing medical and all this other trash. Yeah. You had to wait just to get into processing. Yeah, it was. It was a little bit, and I was, and I, and then I questioned. It's like, well, why did I choose this week? And I, I don't know. I don't really know why. It just kind of happened that way. So. What, what was going on in the world when you joined the Air Force? Not a lot. Uh, I joined the Air Force in 1980. It's kind of the Cold War, um, and I think, you know, I felt that it was a, a safe opportunity uh, that would still give me the options to travel and see different things and experience other cultures that I wasn't getting in Menard but I didn't um, I didn't really I don't think I gave it a lot of thought uh, about what was actually happening in the world at the time all right if you leave you got to stay out okay Someone trying to leave, get out the front door. You can go. You're good. That's why I don't want the door. Are we clear? Okay, so tell me what it was like being a woman in the airport. Were you um, by yourself? Were there a few of you? Were there any Actually, there were quite a few of us uh, in my um, MOS. I don't, what, did we, what do you call it in the Air Force? See, I don't even remember. I've been out so long, but uh, I was a linguist, and there were actually quite a few women uh, that were at the language school the same time that I was, and we built quite a few friendships, and I think what I loved about it was a lot of the women that I was actually at the language school with went with me to Korea. So those that made it through the language school, which was a pretty tough school, but we, uh, we kind of created a little family, I guess you could say, of, of female veterans, uh, not female veterans, but other uh, ladies in, in mixed uh, branches too. So several of my friends were in the Army, I was in the Air Force, there were a couple of women veterans, uh, women, I keep saying veterans, but women that were in the Navy. Uh, we didn't have any Marines in our cohort, but uh, we all stayed connected uh, once we got to Korea, which is where I was stationed, and, um, and stayed together even after we came back. So the interesting thing about being in Korea in the job that I was in is that there were not once we kind of separated, uh, the Army was stationed in one place, Air Force at Osan Air Force, at Osan Air Base, uh, and then the Navy um, went, uh, military members were stationed somewhere else. But at the Air Force Base at Osan, there were uh, quite a few women, but the facilities hadn't changed to accommodate the number of women that were in that job field. So uh, one of the things that I did, one of the first things that I did was I actually advocated for more bathroom facilities for the women. And I got a $25 uh, uh, award because I made the recommendation that they give one of the larger bathrooms to the women because there were so many more of us uh, than I guess there had been in the past. So. How long did you stay in? I was in for four years. What, what was it like when you got out? Were you, were you able to find a job right away? Did you get married? 
Yeah, so when I got out, there were not a lot of transition programs, and I was stationed in Maryland. I got out at Fort Meade. I had been assigned to the National Security Agency, and when I got out, there weren't any programs, but I didn't have any concerns about being able to find a job, and I actually found a job rather quickly. I got a job working for the state of Maryland, and um, I just kind of went about my way. I, I, I didn't know about benefits or services, and nobody had ever communicated that there were any benefits or services aside from the uh, the ability to buy a home, you know, your VA benefit to buy a home. But other than that, I didn't know about the VA or even if those services were available for women back then. And I didn't even ask. I didn't even know to ask. So I think it was a different time. Um, when I got, I believe it was 1984 when women were first being accepted into the academies. So I think there were a lot of changes going on, but I wasn't even really in tune to them at that time. I just kind of said, okay, I'm out. And I went about living my life. All right. So how did you get to Houston? Well, so I don't actually live in Houston, in Austin. So that's quite a span of time. Uh, so kind of a quick history. Uh, after I got out and I was living in Maryland, uh, I had a friend who was in the Army, and she was being stationed in Germany. And I didn't have any commitments. I wasn't married. I didn't have any children. And she said, why don't you come to Germany? She said, my parents are coming. Uh, they're going to go do the whole, you know, touristy thing in Germany. And she says, why don't you come? So I was like, sure. So I quit my job, and I just moved to Germany. And I ended up staying there for four years. I got a job working for a federal contractor, and um, I stayed there for about four or five years, and then I got homesick, and I came back to Texas. So when I came back to Texas, uh, that's when I met my husband, my, my first husband, and, um, and I had my son, and I hadn't used any of my benefits, and I started to have some challenges in my marriage, ended up getting divorced, and there was, um, I, had, I was working and I was living still small town. I had moved back to a small community, not where I grew up, but a, a one very near there. And I was working and one of the ladies there, her family owned the business and she said, you are too smart to be doing this. How can we help you get to school? You need to be going to school. And she was the one who really, I guess, motivated me and encouraged me to take the next step. My son was small, I was a single mom, uh, but fortunately I had a lot of family close and that's one thing a lot of veterans don't have, but I did, I had, I had family close and they helped me and so I really, I just really focused. In four years, I worked three or four different part-time jobs, taking care of my son, uh, and went to school full-time so that I could get um, so I could get my degree. I got my degree in accounting, and made the decision that I needed to leave the small town, and was deciding, trying to decide where I wanted to live. And the options were Austin, Seattle. Uh, was another one that I considered, and I just kind of blasted my resume everywhere. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. I knew how to, to put together a resume and got some help with that. Um, and then I got a call from Dell. And so in 1997, uh, my son was in second grade, uh, moved to Austin with my son, and went to work for Dell. And I worked for Dell for 16 years. And it was a great experience. But um, I knew that there had to be something more. I was getting burned out on the technology. And um, when Dell went private, they were offering separation packages. And I made the decision that I needed to take some time off. So that's what I did. And that's how I ended up in Austin. <laughs> when did you uh, get involved with the veterans community? So. Uh, the, the last years, the last, let's see, it was, t uh, I left Dell at, 
in 2013. In 2010, I made the decision to get my master's degree, uh, to get an MBA. And uh, when I was getting my MBA, there was a female veteran, a, a medically retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force who was in my cohort. Um, my Baylor, I went to Baylor and um, uh, doing the executive program and she was in my cohort and we were talking and she said, well, you're a veteran. And I'm like, well, yeah, I don't know about that. And she's like, no, you served. She said, right? Yeah. I said, yeah, from 80 to 84. I said, it was a long time ago. You know, there was nothing going on. And she's like, don't do that. And I was like, don't do what? And she's like, you served. You made the decision to, um, you know, sign on the dotted line and you gave four years of your life to your country, you can call yourself a veteran. And we built a very strong relationship. We're still very close friends. And um, at the time when I left Dell, she actually uh, went to work for the Texas Veterans Commission. And so I was, um, we were on Facebook and she had posted that she was looking for a women veterans program manager. And so I sent her a message and I said, do you think that's something I could do? And she said, you would be fabulous. Please come work for me. And that's how I ended up at the Texas Veterans Commission. And before that, I didn't even have a clue that they existed. And that was in February of 2016. Yes. How has it changed you working with that? Uh, it has. Even know that you needed it. I, I didn't. Uh, so, so interestingly enough, um, it's I, there were so many things that I that I didn't know. Um, when kind of going back a little bit in history, uh, my mother, um, uh, when she left my father, we were homeless for a while, not on the streets. We lived with a couple of different families. And that was one of the things that I, it never occurred to me that somebody in the military would be homeless. Uh, I, I mean, homeless men, yes, because that's what you always see. But when I found out that there were women veterans who were homeless, I was like, how can that be? You know, it just, it floored me. And, and from that, from my mother's experience, um, I had always, I, there was a point in my life where I actually thought I was going to be a social worker uh, because of that experience and because of the family violence that we had experienced before my mom left. Um, so I thought I was going to be a social worker. That didn't really happen, but I, you kind of get exposed to that when you start advocating for women veterans and you start to see the challenges that women veterans have, and you're like, how can it be that somebody who serves her country gets left behind? And it really just, it just, it took off in me. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's why I guess I, I'm doing what I do now, because it definitely isn't the money, right? We don't do it for the money. And um, I've made good money, but I, I wouldn't go back. For them, I wouldn't go back. Yeah. So what do you attribute to the disconnect? Is it because when people think of veterans, they think of a man? Do you think that's part of why women feel forgotten? Or is I, it because people tend to push everyone under a simple set of labels? I mean, what do you think? Uh, I, I do think, I think a lot of it has to do with the images that that we see, so if you think about homeless, you typically think of a man. Uh, when you think about veterans, you typically think of men because men, I think, are more, um, they show who they are. You know, they display that. They just, you, when they wear their hats, when they wear their shirts, with their tattoos, much more than women do. I think we tend to, um, we tend to kind of mask that because we, maybe part of it is because we want to be accepted. So we want to be accepted now in our, as a civilian. So we don't always share. We, we, we don't share our experiences as much, especially if we're among other men. So 
I don't think it was intentional. I don't think we intentionally tried to hide the fact that we're veterans, but I think we're trying to, we're trying to assimilate. Uh, so, and to do that, that means, you know, not openly displaying the fact that you're a veteran. We don't seek the, I think the, especially if you look at your World War II, Korea, Vietnam veteran men who, you know, almost are always wearing their hats wherever they go. Um, you just, you just don't see that with women. So I think that's, I think that's part of our challenge, right? Is how do we, how do we change the image of what we see as a woman veteran and even specifically about a homeless woman veteran, um, which is one of the big topics and challenges that I'm, I'm very passionate about and that I'm, I'm working on within my own agency to, to change the dialogue and to change what we perceive as homeless. Right, and I think the thing that people don't realize, that the public doesn't necessarily realize, is that homeless women are not, especially if they've suffered any kind of trauma or sexual assault, they're not going to be comfortable in a shelter that's predominantly occupied by men. So they will live in their cars or they will couch surf um, and the problem with that is that they don't get counted in the yearly uh, point in time count that is done by the Department of Labor. So those women get missed and because of that, because they're not getting counted, the facilities to support homeless women veterans are lacking and in some places are non-existent. There's no place for homeless women veterans to go. I think the other thing is that we, women in general, and I would especially women veterans, we don't want to be seen as helpless. And I think trying to portray them as that would be, um, would be dismissive of everything that we have done to serve our country. So I think the image needs to change. We need to show that women who are veterans and homeless are still strong and fierce and may have children, which is another barrier when you're looking for housing for a woman who has children. Uh, women aren't going to take their children to a shelter, especially if there's a chance that their children may get separated from them. So for example, if you have a woman veteran who has a young son that they may feel is too old to stay in the women population, they may expect that woman to put her son in the male population and they're not going to do that. So they're not going to show up at the shelters with their children. There's also a lot of women who are struggling with maybe they're leaving uh, intim intimate partner violence, you know, uh, domestic violence, and there's a fear that they could lose their children if their uh, estranged husband or partner is uh, is looking for them or has reported them as taking their children um, you know there's always this fear that they might lose their children so they're not going to come out and just be readily there for us to count but we have to find a way to connect with them we have to find a way to make their stories heard so that we can so that we can help them. And we can make sure that we've got enough housing and enough shelters to accommodate those women that have that need. So when did you really start noticing at the um, Texas Veterans Commission um, this shift in consciousness and awareness? 
that there were different needs in the women that are in this community that weren't being met by the general, um, agenda, I don't know, agenda? Um, yes. So when I started at the Texas Veterans Commission, the, so they had, we had an initiative. So just a little bit of history about how the women's program came about. In 2011, they had, um, they had a women veterans initiative and they had a single woman veteran coordinator uh, who started to build relationships and stuff within the agency and with other organizations to help women veterans. In 2015, the Women Veterans Program was, esta was established by um, House Bill 867. So that actually established a program, and this was before I came to the Texas Veterans Commission. So what they, what they tried to do uh, is they built a program taking women from other programs, so from the Veterans Employment Program, the Veterans Claims Program, the Veteran Health Care Program, and they found women within those programs who wanted to help build the women's program at the Texas Veterans Commission. So I learned a lot from them. Uh, they were already strongly advocating. They were going around the state having events to, to do outreach, uh, partnering with local communities to have events to educate women about their benefits and services, partnering with the VA, partnering with nonprofits like Catholic Charities, uh, Dress for Success, uh, Grace After Fire. So starting to build those relationships so that together we could get the word out and we could work on legislation. Now. In that first year when I came on, we were in the middle of every other year, the Texas veteran, uh, um, the opposite year that the legislature is in session, there's a council, the Texas Coordinating Council for Veteran Services, made up of multiple agencies, state agencies, and these agencies get together and a lot of them have veterans programs or veteran resources, and we get together and look at gaps in services and benefits, and then we try to provide recommendations to the legislature. This is about a uh, maybe nine month process uh, outside of the legislative session. So in that first year, uh, a lot of the programs have their own work group. There was a work group for women, there's one, a work group for mental health, a work group for employment, work group for uh, claims and health care. So in the Women Veterans Work Group, that was where I got, I really started to see, hear, research, learn about some of these issues, the housing issue, and that's not the only one, there's others. Um, but that was really my first real, I guess you could say, um, picture of what was happening within the veteran community and the women veterans community. Uh, after that first year, so this is my, uh, we are in this process again. Uh, we um, are putting together our recommendations. Yesterday, actually, I was, I was working on the report that there will be a report out to the council on the 17th, and I was working on that, and, and part of, of that uh, was the topic of, of homelessness and housing. And so some of these things that I'm sharing with you, like changing the dialogue, uh, and when I say changing the dialogue, one of the things that we have to take into consideration, if you think about my own story, I didn't relate as a veteran, but if you ask somebody, did you serve in the armed forces? I, could have, I would have said, yeah, I served in the armed forces, but you ask me if I'm a veteran, well, I didn't deploy, I wasn't in combat, you know, so that's part of the dialogue that we feel needs to be changed. And then the second, the second part of that is changing how we see women veterans, especially women veterans with children uh, and women veterans who need housing. When did you start to hear about um, the, the push to have Women Veterans Day recognized in Texas? 
So I didn't really hear about it until uh, pretty late in the, I guess, in the process. What's kind of interesting, so working for the Texas Veterans Commission, of course, you know, we, you know, and when you work for a state agency and when you're advocating for uh, veterans or, or other groups, you have to be apolitical, right? So you, you don't want to ever come across as having any kind of political bias because you want to serve everybody in the population that you're trying to support or advocate for. So, and I think still, I was still relatively new to the agency, so I hadn't done, I hadn't been asked to testify or to provide any kind of testimony. So I wasn't on the front line, I guess you could say. I wasn't sitting there in front of the committees advocating or testifying on behalf of women veterans yet. So, um, so I, I kind of heard about it late in the game. And uh, I was excited about it, but I wasn't really sure exactly what it was going to mean. Right, because it sounds like you're trying to separate from the men. Can you just kind of, um, why is it important that we have a separate day? Okay, so why Women Veterans Day is important is to create awareness. There are so many women veterans like myself who have dismissed their service when they shouldn't have. There's many of the public who forget or don't know or never knew or maybe didn't know that they needed to care that women had a place in the military, still have a place in the military and that are like some of the women that you're talking to that are still advocating for women's services, they're not aware that there's differences in the way women um, in the way women reveal, I guess, their symptoms of the challenges that they have. Um, and so I, I think Women Veterans Day was really the launching pad for real awareness in the state about the service of women in the military. I think there, you know, the people, families that have had, you know, years of or, or generations of people serving in the military. They've had, you know, men and women serving in the military and their families to them. They don't think anything of it, but there's a large part of the population who have family members who never served for, you know, maybe not because they didn't want to, but maybe because they couldn't. Um, and, and so they're not as aware that women serve. And I think the other thing too is that there's, a lot of misconceptions about the things that women are capable of doing uh, in the military and how much influence that women have had because of their military service. I mean, if you think about the women's right to vote, uh, a lot of that was driven by women who served during World War I and who advocated for the women's right to vote. So we played such an important part in history and I, I really think that Women Veterans Day is really the, the catalyst for creating that awareness. And, and, and I, you know, I, I just think we have to keep the momentum going. To some extent, um, I, I do believe that, that many more of them understand now why there's a separate Women Veterans Day, but there's still a lot of women that don't. And, and, I, and I understand their position, right? If you go into the military, especially if you go into a job or a field that is predominantly male, and you, every day, you are busting your butt to prove yourself, to show that you can do just as much as the 
man standing next to, next to you. When you get out, you don't want to have to justify why you deserve to be called veteran. You don't want to have to answer those questions. You, you served, and that should be enough. I w I'm a veteran. I served honorably. It shouldn't matter. The problem is, is that because there's not a lot of awareness that women serve, a lot of times they get missed. Here's an example. I don't want to, I don't want to give any names, but there was, a, there was a, an event where um, a woman veteran, World War II era, was sitting with a uh, group of male World War II veterans that were being recognized sitting in the front row with these male veterans. They're going down the line, shaking the hands of all of the, the veterans, thanking them for their service. When they got to her, they skipped her. Even though she's sitting there with all the World War II veterans, instead of Assuming that she was a veteran, she, it was automatically assumed that she was the spouse. This still happens. This still happens. And that's part of what we need to change. That has got to change. Instead of, especially if women are going to get services, if they're going to get services, why would you assume that they're the spouse? Why not just assume that they're the veteran? Yeah. The stories, but when you heard all this was really going to happen, what? How did you all respond? <laughs> so. About four minutes of this card, it might be good for me to change it out. Okay. Um, and so I make sure I get the whole response. Is that okay? Yeah, we might be done in four minutes. Okay, well, I can just roll it. Okay, we're almost done. I want to yeah. hear how y'all responded and, and what you did. Right. Right. So. Um, when we heard that there was going to be, you know, that this that the bill had passed uh, for Women Veterans Day, we were excited about it, and initially we were thinking really big. I like, what can we do? We could do a parade. We could do, you know, we could do all these things. And then I had the opportunity uh, to meet uh, Romaine, and Romaine uh, was already kind of running with it. I mean, she like picked up the ball and she was like, this is it. We're going to make this big. We're going to show people that women serve. We're going to recognize them for their service. We're going to do all these things. And so and as I continued my conversations with her and I continued my conversations with the women veterans that worked for the Texas Veterans Commission, kind of where we ended up was, okay, as the Texas Veterans Commission, what is my responsibility? Within the statute, my responsibility is to recognize women veterans. My responsibility is to create public awareness. My responsibility is to advocate women veter for women veterans and connect them to benefits and services. And my responsibility is to make legislative recommendations. And so it was at that point that I thought, there's going to be a lot of celebrating going on. There's going to be a lot of events that are going to be focused on recognition. What can I do that's a little different, but that will really give this day real teeth, real meaning? And so that's when I made the decision to create the roundtable discussions that we had in Austin where I brought women from all over the state together to talk about the issues, to get their input. Well, how do you feel about the lack of childcare for women veterans? Well, what about women veteran support groups? Do we have enough support groups? How do we get women connected to these support groups? Housing. How do we make sure there's enough housing for women veterans? What about women veterans with children? How do we create awareness? How do we break down barriers? So bringing those women to Austin and having those conversations is what's helping me put together the recommendations that will go to the legislators 
uh, in September. So we're working on that report now, but I just, I felt like that was how I could contribute to everything that everybody else was doing throughout the state uh, to make Women Veterans Day n not just a, I, I don't want to downplay the celebration because I think that's important too. We need to celebrate women veterans, but to add to it, to to give it to give it teeth, like I said before, uh, to make it stronger, to make it actually really mean something, right? That we're gonna we're not just gonna celebrate you, but we're gonna advocate for you at the at the highest level that we can, so that we can make life better for women veterans and and get to the point where when you say veteran, people don't just think of men, that they think of women too.